Well, I'm back from vacation. I missed you guys. Did you miss me? It's lonely without you. You know, but even though one is the loneliest number, there are times when we need a little alone time. And honestly, this vacation was one of them. I had a tough spring. In fact, um, it was really tough. Uh, I needed a little recharge time. In fact, uh, some of the staff actually got a video of me going into vacation that last week. I wanted to show it to you. <laughs> I was in bad shape, all right? But I, I had a great recharge time, and I'm coming back excited uh, about this new season. You know, as Kirby said, we are a church that says, come as you are. But then we say, live connected, because it is when we get connected relationally that God actually transforms us as people, and then we are able to actually bring something to the world that makes the world a better place. We change the world around us. And you know what really needs changing in the world around us is how isolated and alone so many people feel. So today, I'm going to tell you nothing new. Isn't that exciting? I'm actually not going to teach you anything today. Nothing at all that you don't already know, either intuitively or you've heard me say it before. You know this. You already know it. So some of you are already getting out your smartphones to do something stupid. Don't. Okay? I didn't say this isn't important. I said you already know it. It's incredibly important. In fact, what we're going to talk about today, I believe, is more important than just about anything else you can think about for the next 30 minutes or so. It's incredibly important. You know, it's interesting. Um, in 2 Peter 1, Peter, you know, one of Jesus' closest followers, says this. He says, I will always remind you of these things even though you know them. That's what I'm doing today. Uh, I'm reminding us of some things that we already know because what we're going to talk about actually addresses what that drama and that song deal with. What's really wrong with this world and what's God's solution actually? You know, 3,500 years ago, God gave Moses uh, what's come to be known as the Ten Commandments, right? But he also gave a, a summary statement uh, of those commandments. The first summary statement is actually found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. It says this, and this became kind of the mantra of, of the people of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's only one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So to love God with all we've got, that's the first, that's first. And do you know that the first four of the Ten Commandments are actually explaining what that means to love God? And then the next six are actually all about how we should treat people. And the summary statement for that is found in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. Interesting, 1,500 years after Moses, Jesus gets asked, by the religious leaders of his day who were trying to trap him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He quotes Deuteronomy 6. This is the first and greatest command. Now, note, he wasn't asked for a second one. But you can't divorce these two. The second, he said, is like it, goes with it. Love your neighbor as much as you do yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Jesus says, love God first, but you can't disconnect loving God who you can't see from loving your neighbor who you do see. That's, that's in 1 John 4, right? And he says, all the law of Moses and all that the prophets wrote, all the 66 books of the Bible actually are merely commentary on what it means to do these two simple things. Nothing new, Right? Anybody hearing this for the first time or don't intuitively know that loving God and loving other people is a good thing, right? All right, then why in the world do I have to teach on it? I'm bored of teaching this. Aren't you bored of hearing this? Yeah, so why do I feel compelled to remind us of these things? Well, here's why. You know, Jesus was once asked by a group of people, 
Uh, Jesus once asked this of a group of people. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Ouch. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, it's something we've got to pay attention to. In other words, God doesn't really care about what we know as much as he cares about what we do with the things we know. Right? He wants us to actually live out what we know. And, and here's the thing. I know you guys well enough to know this. You don't want to just play church. Right? I mean, you, you know, you don't want to be people who just come and, and sit and, and sing songs and listen to a message and feel good, but nothing changes in your daily life. That's playing church. People do that. I know you don't want to do that. I mean, all, all over, there are people who literally, like, they just go on Sunday to get a religious fix. It, it just helps them feel better for some reason. You know, they hear some message, it inspires them, they sing some warm, warm fuzzy songs, it's kind of like a concert, you know. But then daily, their lives don't grow to be more loving people, to be more full of joy or peace. They're not really any more self-controlled week to week or year to year. They, their, their spouses or their kids would not say they're becoming more kind or, 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 or loving or gentle or life-giving to the people around them. And that is not what we want to be. I know you guys, and I know you don't want to play church, and I definitely don't want to play church. We want to be people who actually do what Jesus said. So today, we're going to talk about how to love where you live, starting right in your own homes with your family or your roommates and out to your neighbors. Because like Jesus said, that's actually connected to how we love God. And you know what's wild about it is when we do that, it solves so many of, of society's problems. You know, tomorrow, um, I'm going to be away with, with 10 pastors of other churches here in Austin, and, and we're going to be talking a, a, about this. You know, um, for about the last seven years, we've been meeting together. We went and met, I told you, we went and met with the, with the mayor and city council. Uh, it was probably six or seven years ago. And, and we asked, if, if we could get the churches united in Austin to serve our city, what could we do? And, you know, what came out of that was the third grade mentoring initiative. They said, you know, if kids don't learn to read by the fifth grade, then they're, they're not reading to learn in junior high to, predicts all these other problems. And so what's really cool is our churches, there are about 400 united in Austin now, and, and we're mentoring in about half the schools in need in Austin. But, but other cities have started to do this. In fact, some friends of mine in Denver went and met with, with the mayor there, and they asked the same question. They said, if we could serve the city, what could we do to help as, as the church? And um, they talked about all kinds of, of social ills, like kids at risk and, and child hunger and drug and alcohol abuse and loneliness and elderly shut-ins who no one cared for and on and on. And then after about an hour, they, they said the mayor stopped and said, you know, the majority of the issues our community is facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community of great neighbors. Silence in the room. And then the mayor goes on to explain that, you know, because, because the reality is government programs are not nearly as good at solving society's problems as relationships are. Because relationships are organic and compassion-driven and they're ongoing. And my friend Jay said, after the mayor left, they sat there, you know, looking at each other. And, and he asked the, the pastors in the room, he said, am I the only one who's a little bit embarrassed that we just asked the mayor how the churches could serve the city. And I think he basically said, well, it would be great if you would actually do what Jesus said. <laughs> and this group of pastors sat there asking each other, do we even know the names of the neighbors who live right around us? And almost all of them realize they don't even know their names. You can't really love someone if you don't even know their name, Right? <laughs> And, and, you know, the truth is, this is how most of us live. In this group of pastors I meet with, we did the same thing and realized, man, so many of us, we don't even know the names of the people around us. Now, in, this, in, in Denver, this changed the way they went about leading their churches and engaging their neighbors. And they ended up writing a book called The Art of Neighboring, um, which I'd highly recommend you get. But last year, and what we're going to be talking about tomorrow on this planning retreat, is that 
you know, if we could get all the churches who did explore God a number of years ago, about 400 churches, if, if we could together help the people in our churches just simply do this one thing, you know, the, these churches that are helping mentor kids, if we could work together to actually get people to love the eight or so neighbors that live right around them, what might that do? Well, I think it would profoundly change us and it would profoundly change our city. Because think about this, if, if just you and me, right, because if, if, we can only take ownership for ourselves, if just you and me, and then all the people across Austin right now sitting in churches listening to a message this Sunday morning, if we would just start to think about how I can love the eight or so people that I live right around, do you know that would touch two million people in our city? It's just the people sitting in churches listening to messages today. Two million people would not feel so isolated and alone and might actually feel loved. So last year I gave you a head start um, and I passed out a, a, a card, looked kind of like the card that, uh, that we passed out today and I gave you all a quiz. You remember this? Like, oh, we did that last year. Don't do that again. I felt horrible after that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> But, but I pass this out. See, here, here's, here's something that we do. Here's something we do, especially if we've been in church for a while, okay? If we've been in church for a while, we already know we're supposed to love our neighbor. But then we go, yeah, but, but you know, Jesus, there was this parable, and they asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan was someone who was hurt on the road. And so what we realize is that it's, you know, my neighbor is whoever God puts in my path. So my neighbor's not just like my literal physical neighbor. It's whoever God puts in my path. So everyone's my neighbor. And then what we do with that is we don't love the people right in our own homes or right around us because everyone's our neighbor. But think about it. The people literally in our own homes and right around us are definitely our neighbors, right? And so if we're not starting there to love them, aren't we missing the point of the whole thing? And, and so we, we did this um, to get us to just start thinking about it. So I want to do this, this quiz again, um, just to see how many of us made progress from, from last year. Um, so, so here's a chart. We'll put it up, up here as well. If you've got one of these, I want to encourage you to just get out a, a, a pen. If you don't have a pen, get out your smartphone. Now, this is something smart you can do with your smartphone. All right, get out your smartphone and just open it up to notes and, or, or maybe even in reminders. And, and I want you to put down the names, uh, look at this chart, put down the names of your eight neighbors around you. Now, your, your neighborhood may not lay out like this, or maybe you're in an apartment complex, and, but just any eight neighbors, just try to write down their names. Okay, go, go ahead and do this. I really, this is like serious. I really want you to do this. <laughs> See, that's what I mean is we don't want to be people that just play church. We want to actually do what Jesus says. So, so start writing down any names that you can think of, uh, of the people around you. Because again, we can't love God who we don't see if we don't love our neighbor who we do see, right? And you can't love your neighbor if you don't first know their name. Now, as you're doing that, let me just say, if you're feeling bad right now, you don't need to because, you know, these guys who do this in, in churches and groups of people all around the country have discovered only 10% of people can write down eight names of people who live around them. Only 10%. So don't feel bad. Nobody loves anybody. All right? Yeah, my, exactly my point. And that is exactly what's wrong. All right, keep going. Second question, going a little deeper. Of the names of neighbors that you do know, what facts can you write down about them? All right, now these are not things that you can observe, like, well, they planted begonias in their front yard, or they take their trash out on Sunday and don't bring it back in until Wednesday. You know, those are things you can see from the front window without talking. All right, well, any facts you might know uh, about them? Um, like I know that uh, one of my neighbors is a single mom who moved here from California and, and her son uh, is a junior in high school and wants to go to an Ivy League school and he's a good skateboarder. In fact, he got sponsored. Another one of my neighbors is a, a, an ocean compli OSHA compliance engineer. Another one's a gamer, uh, writes games and also moved from California. And it's a California takeover, I tell you. What, what, what facts do you know? Now, here's why that's important. Because 
because learning things about your neighbor shows you care about them, right? I mean, you don't feel loved by someone if they don't even take time to know anything about you, do you? But, But it's not that hard just taking interest in people and asking them questions and and getting to know things about them is the beginning of actually learning to love them now just so you know only about three percent of people can write down a simple fact about the eight of their uh, neighbors who live around them all right now we're going to do some extra credit this should go real fast for many of us write down any in-depth information any personal stuff that you know about any of those neighbors, dreams they have, career plans, maybe struggles or motivations or addictions they've had, or maybe uh, their spiritual or religious background, how they feel about God now, or um, maybe fears or things they hope for. Now, this requires a greater level of trust, right? For someone to open up and be vulnerable with you, they've got to feel accepted, liked, maybe even loved, right? And, and yet when we get to this place with people, it's amazing how it changes us and it changes them. People want a safe place to talk. You know, I'm amazed at how um, I've been able to have conversations about the deepest stuff uh, with the people right around me or even people who, you know, come over. People want to be able to talk, but so few find people who actually care about them, to take the time to listen. Now, you know, this should be easy for for those of us who follow Jesus because, you know, Jesus came to tell people that this is the time of God's favor, that God is for you. He's not against you. So if we're people who go with that heart and that message, we create safe space and people will feel safe and they'll feel like finally they have a friend they can open up to. But I also want to tell you this, just in, in, in all honesty, I do not feel like I've done a very good job this last year with this. Not at all. I have not loved my neighbors well. Partially because, you know, when you feel like you're, you know, under the pile uh, or, or things are happening that you can't, your, your life's feeling out of control, it's hard to think about others, isn't it? And, and I didn't want to talk about this at all because I feel like I haven't done very well. And that's our tendency. is like when we don't feel like we're doing very well, we'd rather just ignore it. But, but this is the thing. You know, I don't want us to just feel beat up and, and overwhelmed by this because what we want to do is just improve. We want to keep growing and getting better at it. So don't guilt yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Just think about this, you know. If, if you know one more name this year than you did last year or one more fact this year than you did last year, pat yourself on the back. How many of you know one more name or one more fact this year about your neighbors than last year? That's good. That's great improvement. And let's keep growing. Let's be people who don't just hear but actually put it into practice because it not only will change us, it changes the world around us. So I want to talk for a few minutes about my own life and probably yours too and, and some of the things I've discovered of why this is so difficult to do and some ways that we can keep growing to be more loving people. You know, for most of us, for me too, the, we're just too busy. I mean, this is probably the biggest barrier, right? I mean, I think about me. I work 50 to 60 hours a week. I know I know, I thought you only worked on Sunday. Ha, ha, ha. No, okay? And, and I work with people, and, and so I hear people problems all week. You probably do too. And so you come home, and the last thing you want are more people and more people problems in your own neighborhood. Am I right? Yes. Okay. So we got to be honest about that. And then there are bills to pay, and there's texts and emails to answer, and chores, and Facebook, and exercise. And if you have kids, they take a little time, don't they? (laughs) Yeah. And if they're in dance or sports or involved, then you have a side job as a taxi driver, right? And so you just don't have any time. Now, here's the thing, though. If we're actually going to follow Jesus, we've got to make time. And this is the first thing that we all have to realize it truly is a choice. It's a choice. Because, because think about it. Um, we are always making choices. You know, 20 years ago, I think about this. 
20 years ago, you couldn't even make a phone call while driving in your car. You realize that? You had to wait till you got home and use something that was plugged into a wall. Archaic. That's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you couldn't even send or receive texts or emails while you were driving. You couldn't get arrested for it either. And now you can get both, right? (laughs) Do you know 20 years ago, if you wanted to send written correspondence, you actually had to put it in an envelope and entrust it to the postal service, and it went slower than a snail, which is why we call it snail mail now, right? If you wanted to talk to somebody face-to-face who actually lived in another city, you had to actually go there. (gasps) That's what my wife and I had to do dating, and it was a very expensive dating time, right? Now we've got Skype. We've got video chat. Now, if 20 years ago I said, you know, 20 years from now, you will have all this technology. Think about how much time it's going to save you. You'd be thinking about, wow, I don't know what I'll do with all that time. That's the way we think. But that's not how it's worked, is it? No, we've just crammed in more stuff to redline again. We will always make choices to put what we think is most important in our lives. We always will. We'll always fill it up. Dallas Willard, philosophy professor at USC, used to say that our society has what he calls hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. He said, hurry is the enemy of love. Because if you can't give people your attention, those people will will never feel loved. Love takes time. Takes time. But it's always worth it. Why? Because it enriches your life. When you take the time to love the people in your own house and the houses or apartments around you, it enriches your life and theirs, and you feel better about yourself. And here's the irony of the whole thing. Subconsciously, you know what we're hurrying to try to do? To prove that we're lovable. (laughs) Do do you find that ironic? (laughs) That we hurry around trying to prove we're successful or good enough to be loved, and what God actually wants is us to love him enough to listen and let him calm our anxious hearts about that so we know what we're worth and we know we're loved so that we can share that love with our neighbors and those in our own household and it begins to heal what's wrong with all of us. But we have, we have to take the time. We have to find a way to make the time. And so that means you just have to start noticing what's going on around you. Do you know that one one out of four people that you see walking around or coming and going in your neighborhood, if they were honest, according to the Gallup poll, they would say they don't have one close friend. They don't have one person that they could talk things over with, no one who they feel like really cares. That's the world we live in, and God cares. You know, a, a, a woman here at Gateway, a friend of mine, confessed one time that, that she and her husband were too busy to, to get to know their neighbors until one night they saw an ambulance and a fire truck out in front of this neighbor's house. And so later that week, they made a meal and went over um, and knocked on the door. Nobody answered. The car was in the driveway, but nobody answered. Next night, came back over, knocked again. Uh, a week later, tried again. Finally, they talked to one of the other neighbors, and the other neighbor explained that the person living there was a widower. He lived there alone, and he'd had a heart attack and died. And they sat there and watched. No one came to the house. No one did anything with the car for like months. And she realized she didn't even know this guy's name. She didn't know his story. And now it was too late. You know, it's a very broken, lonely world beneath the surface. And that's actually what Jesus sees. You know, Jesus once went through the villages and across the neighborhoods of Galilee. And it says in Matthew 9, 36, he looked out over a crowd and and he had compassion for them. He said, because beneath the surface, he could see they were distressed and downcast. It's where most people live. And, And God has compassion. That's why he sent Jesus as the Messiah into the world. God entered into our suffering to demonstrate that he has compassion for a world that's hurting and in need. And you know what? He still has compassion. And he still has a plan. But you and I are his plan. And that means if we're gonna demonstrate his love and compassion, we gotta make time. 
Now, I want to give you a couple of simple ideas that you can put into practice. And one is this chart. If you didn't get one coming in, pick one up on, on the way out. And just start to make this a daily adventure with, with God to discover and fill in the names of, of eight people who live around you and any little extra facts, you know, or, or deeper conversations you can get in. And, and I would encourage you to put this somewhere where you can see it. I put mine by my bathroom mirror. So you can sit there and, you know, it, it's a reminder to just pray for my neighbors. And you can do it while you're brushing your teeth. And if one of your neighbors crosses them, you can spit out in the sink, you know, when you think about it. No, that's not why you want to do that. No, you can put it somewhere where, where you'll be reminded each day. Now, do you know why that can make a huge difference? That simple thing of putting it somewhere where, where you'll remember each day and pray for them. Because of your reticular activating system. You know what your reticular activating system is? It's this part of your brain that takes all this information and tells you what's important and what's not. You may not realize it, but your brain is helping you discern what do you need to pay attention to and what do you need to not uh, every day. Uh, simple example of this. You're, you're driving along the freeway and you're passing silver SUVs all the time and you don't notice them at all. And then you decide to buy a car and you start to think, I'm interested in a silver SUV. And all of a sudden, everywhere you go, what do you see? Why do you see silver SUVs everywhere? Your reticular activating system is now telling you you've made it focus and tell you what's important to you so that you are aware see that well the good thing is you can train your reticular activating system to to help you see what's important according to god which is loving your neighbors right it's a way that you can can love god and so something as simple as as putting this uh by by your mirror you know that will help you just begin to pray and remember, and it'll make it a lot easier for you to engage with your neighbors. Second idea, just get out more. Just get out more. Be intentional. Sounds simple, but just walk your dog before it gets dark each night and and pay attention. Walk your cat. That'll get attention. Nobody walks a cat. Cats don't cooperate, do they, like that? Drag it along. That'll, That'll get all your neighbors out. Just kidding. You know, my son, my son walks our dog every night. He knows everyone in our neighborhood. He's kind of like that too. And uh, this week he was gone. And so I was walking uh, our dog around the corner and, um, you know, far down the street. And there's a guy out in the yard and I, and I said, hey, how's it going? And he looks up and he goes, oh, I'm used to seeing that young, good looking guy walking that dog. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, I'm the older, uglier parent version. (laughs) But I am proof that God can make beautiful things out of dirt. (laughs) But if we're going to follow Jesus, we've got to be intentional. You know, Charles, our executive pastor, and his wife, Raquel, uh, they realized they have younger kids, and they realized that they were doing everything in the backyard with their kids, so they just moved it out to the front. They literally put a, 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 a table like a picnic table out in their front yard and started doing projects and things out in the front yard. And they said it was amazing how many neighbors would just stop by and they would get into conversations. They've also done intentional things on holidays like Halloween. They always do Halloweeners out on their driveway. Now they'll have like 40 or 50 of their neighbors over. You know, you got Labor Day coming up. Maybe just have a a barbecue. Invite your neighbors over. Or you got football season coming. Invite your neighbors over to watch Baylor football, because you wouldn't want them to watch UT football. That will kill any party these days, right? <laughs> Forgive me. I know I've sinned. I'm a UT alum. I, I, I really want it to get better. But Jesus said, where, where your uh, treasure is, there your heart is also. And I got two kids and a lot of money going to Baylor. So one now, fortunately, one just graduated. So my heart is there right now. How about apartment complexes? What if you live in an apartment? Well, that might be challenging, but you can. Do you know that apartment owners are looking for people who will organize events because it helps people want to stay when they get to know their neighbors and it helps cut down on all kinds of problems? You know, there's an organization called Apartment Life. Um, The head of it used to go to Gateway. We've partnered with them before. Apartment Life, you can get free rent if you will just organize events for the people in your apartment complex. 
Here's their, their mission statement. Our passion is sending CARES teams into apartment communities to change the world simply by loving their neighbors. Isn't that awesome? So you don't have to make it difficult. You can start small. Just start to, to put a chart somewhere where you can focus on it to change your reticular activating system. Just start praying that you can get to know the names of your neighbors. Pray for those neighbors. Pray for the things you learn about them. And then get in t- intentional about interacting. And watch how you start to live out the greatest two commandments. And watch how it changes how much you love where you live. Next week, we're going to talk about how to have powerful conversations. And this will help not only with your neighbors, it'll help with your spouse, it'll help you at work as well. So you don't want to miss that. Well, I'm going to turn it over to our campuses now. And uh, here at McNeil, we're going we're to take our offering while the band plays a song.